All right, thank you all for joining me for seven steps to lower costs while improving application performance. Well, in fact, maybe a better title would be seven ways to lower costs while improving application performance because you don't necessarily need to follow these in order. Some may or may not be uh, as applicable to you. So let's call it seven ways to lower your costs while improving application performance. My name is Boyd McGeeky. I head up the go-to-market organization for what we call Flexible Compute. Our mission is to help customers build resilient, performant, and low-cost applications on top of AWS's compute portfolio. All right, we have a packed agenda today, so let's jump into it. I'm not gonna read each and every one of these out, um, but I do wanna, I guess, share with why we're here trying to help you lower your overall costs, uh, particularly while operating on AWS. And I think uh, Andy Jassy, the Amazon CEO, said his best when he said, we don't wanna make money from customers that aren't getting value from us, All right? How many of your partners call you and say, stop spending money? Uh, and so that's what we're here to do today, to help you lower your costs while improving your application performance. So let's jump in. Well, first and foremost, for those of you who haven't actually migrated to the cloud, uh, that would actually be my first piece of advice to improve performance and lower costs. You know, cloud infrastructure, I imagine most of you are familiar with these concepts, but what we're able to do on our end is invest significantly in delivering, you know, cost performance improvements and passing them back to you. You know, as an example, when we deliver something like PCI com compliance so that you can store credit card details in the AWS cloud, all customers benefit from that investment uh, in that security feature for you. The same thing happens where we're at a scale where we can invest in improving the overall cost structure on our end that wouldn't make sense in operating your own data center, but it makes sense at our scale, and then we can pass those savings back to you. And of course, in addition to all of this, you get the flexibility to use different services, to scale dynamically, uh, and of course, most importantly, the flexibility to scale down when you don't need something anymore and, and stop paying. So my first way to improve your costs and improve performance is actually start the migration to the AWS cloud. If you are in that journey or about to start that journey, we actually do have a lot of migration tools and support to help you. Uh, so please don't be backwards in, in reaching out for that type of support uh, and some of those services and, and products that we offer. All right, so you've started your journey, you've started migrating, some of you hopefully are already running uh, on the cloud. So the next step to consider, I would say, is actually, or the, the next way to consider is, consider adopting serverless computing. You know, why serverless or what is it? It's, it's no infrastructure, no provisioning, no management, right? So keep in mind, saving money also means saving your humans time so they can invest elsewhere. Um, in addition to that, it automatically scales. Right? So it's automatically responding to the actual demand that your customers have for your products uh, and you know, not running when you don't need that capacity, which means you're only paying when the services are actually delivering value for you and your customers. And then finally, of course, it, it's highly available and secure. And so when we think about serverless, a lot of people naturally think about Lambda and, and AWS Fargate, but keep in mind there are more serverless offerings than just those compute platforms. There is things like Amazon Aurora Serverless, right? A, a database service that is completely serverless, no management on your behalf. Um, things like API Gateway, Step Functions. Uh, so don't just think about Lambda and Fargate as ways to go serverless. Explore the other options that could help reduce your management overhead, improve performance, and lower cost uh, by adopting this. But I'm sure a lot of you are saying, well, hey, I, I actually am using Lambda. I, I am already leveraging the compute platform. Is there a way for me to optimize? And my, my first tip, the first thing you should try if you're already leveraging Lambda is please go and leverage the AWS, uh, sorry, the Lambda Power Tuner. You know, really simply, all you need to do is run a sample payload. Then this tuner is automatically going to report on the function that delivers the best cost and performance for your application. So it's a really quick, super easy way to start optimizing saving costs and potentially improving performance right now uh, without much extra work at all, right? Use the, the power tuner and, and listen to its answers uh, and take advantage of those savings. My final point I wanna make on serverless before we move on here is a lot of you might've explored uh, Lambda in the past and decided, hey, you know, for us, the performance just isn't where we need for some of the slower startup times, for sort of the long tail of the functions that we wanna run on Lambda. Uh, and so now is time to reevaluate because at the end of 2022 at reInvent, we launched AWS Lambda Snapstart, which provides up to 10x faster startup performance, uh, particularly, again, for those long tail uh, 
processes. You know, this gives you a, a quick idea, right? You know, your P50, your, your average type of, of workload uh, would normally start within eight milliseconds with or without snap start. <clears throat> but you see the really big difference in the long tail here, where we see the time for this application to start running goes from over 5,000 milliseconds to just over 500 using the new snap start feature. So my main point here is if you've explored serverless and ruled it out for performance concerns in the past, now's the time to reevaluate uh, because snap starts really changed the game for Lambda applications. All right, now you've hopefully gone and found a, a bunch of different opportunities to leverage serverless, um, but you're still gonna have some type of EC2 instances running almost certainly to power uh, your broad array of, of workloads that you need to run. So now we wanna talk about matching that instance type that you're using specifically to your application needs. Now, <clears throat> there is over 600 different instance types available for you to choose from. Um, things like, you know, there's general purpose, there's compute optimized, memory optimized. Of course, there's things like storage optimized if you need really high IO or really high throughput. Um, and then there's things like GPUs, FPGAs, accelerated compute, uh, a variety of different processes, you know, a bunch of different options to consider here um, that almost certainly together is gonna end up with the best bang for buck, uh, the ideal instance and configuration for your workload. But please don't be intimidated by the 600 options. You don't need to go and learn them all. In fact, the way I would tell you to get started is, you know, just sort of answer these three questions. What are the processes that I'm able to use? What are my workloads performance requirements? In particular, what are those bottlenecks? What are those things that, uh, is it CPU bound? Is it memory bound? Is it network bound? Is it disk bound? What are those core performance requirements and bottlenecks? Uh, and then of course, is it, is it elastic? Is it uh, consistent? What's the overall consumption pattern um, of that? And once you've answered those questions, we can actually automate the process of finding the best first instance for you to try for that application with attribute-based instance selection. With this service, uh, as we talked about, you really just need to know, hey, like these are my minimum CPU, minimum memory, um, and then we can go out and actually find the instance that meets or exceeds those specifications that you've put in at the absolute cheapest price, right? So in this example, we're saying uh, we need a minimum of four vCPUs, uh, just over 32,000 uh, megs, uh, and it's gone and automatically found the instance type that best matches that. Now, if you're still a little bit intimidated and you're thinking 600 options, even if I know my specs, how do I ensure I'm actually running on the most optimal instance types? Well, again, we have a tool for that. Uh, we have, in fact, a number of tools for that. Uh, Trust Advisor, there's some trust management tools, but I'm gonna focus in on the AWS Compute Optimizer here, which provides a deep dive recommendation based on your actual usage metrics. And this is the really important thing about operating in the cloud, is if you discover that you're actually now running on a suboptimal instance type, whether it's because what you thought were the performance characteristics were wrong, or potentially because you've actually added new functionality or done a performance optimization work on your code, the AWS Compute Optimizer is always analyzing those metrics, will make a recommendation on a better instance for you to run, and then you can make that change and one second later, you're benefiting from a lower cost uh, and equal or greater performance um, because you are in the cloud, right? So um, leverage this tool. This isn't a one and done. This is something that you should come back to on a semi-regular basis and say, hey, now that we've made all of these changes, are we still running in the most optimal way? Has AWS launched a new instance type that provides even better bang for buck? The AWS Compute Optimizer is gonna help you uh, make those decisions uh, and feel confident that you're making the right decisions consistently. All right, so we've right-sized the instance types, we've explored serverless, now it's time to select the purchase model that best fits your budget and the nature of the workloads that are running on those instances. If you've ever attended an, an AWS presentation about compute before, you've likely see the, seen a slide similar to this. Um, you know, there's three core purchase options to consider when it comes to leveraging EC2 instances. You know, first there's on-demand. You know, almost every customer in the world uses some amount of on-demand. You pay by the second, no long-term commitments. When you don't need it anymore, you give it back to us and one second later you stop getting charged. It's really fantastic for stateful, spiky, spiky workloads and when you're just, just experimenting, getting started. Then there's savings plans. Savings plans offer savings of up to 72% over that on-demand price we just discussed in exchange for a commitment for one to three years. 
Uh, the main sort of big extra thing to consider with savings plans is it really is ideal for workloads or instance types that are going to be on most of the time. You know, maybe not 24 by 7, but, but most of the time. Um, and as I say, by making that commitment to continue using it, you receive this significant discount. We'll dive into that in a little bit more detail in a moment here. And then finally, near and dear to my heart, uh, one of the most powerful tools to optimize your overall compute costs is spot instances. Spot instances are our spare capacity, available up to 90% discount over the on-demand price. The way we're able to actually deliver that significant discount though, is that spot instances can be interrupted when we need to return them back to on-demand or savings plans customers, right? So that means it's great for fault tolerant, flexible workloads um, that can handle that interruption. And when I talk about flexible, you know, for the most part, I just mentioned we have 600 instance types. When an, uh, a good spot customer gets interrupted, let's say we take the uh, M6 large away from them, they might automatically replace that really quickly with the M6i dot large, right? So that's what it means to be flexible and fault tolerant. They're willing to say, listen, I won't get the absolute best instance for my workload because I know I'm saving a lot of money. So I'll just select any instance that meets or exceeds the specs that work for me. All right, let's spend a little bit more time on savings plans because there's actually three different types of savings plans options. The first and most popular because it provides the greatest flexibility is compute savings plans. It provides discounts of up to 66% over the on-demand price. And as I mentioned, it's, it's incredibly flexible. You don't need to specify a specific region or instance family or size. That means one day you can be running in the Singapore region using the M5 large. And then the next day you could be running in the London region using a GPU. And Compute Savings Plans is going to automate the process of finding and applying the maximum discount that we can for the instances that you have running. In addition to all of that flexibility, it also provides you the flexibility to move to something like Lambda or Fargate and continue to take advantage of those Compute Savings Plans. So if you're in the middle of a, of a serverless journey, you can still start saving using Compute Savings Plans today. Then there's the option where you would actually be a little bit more specific, where you would say, hey, I'm going to run a specific instance type, you know, let's say a GPU, a specific GPU in the Singapore region for the next year or next three years. So you're being a little bit more specific, which provides us even greater insights into what you specifically need. So we're able to provide an even more significant discount, now up to 72%. And it's still flexible, right? You can still change sizes, operating systems, and tenancy. Uh, you've just told us the specific region and instance type that you're going to continue to use. And then finally, there's the SageMaker savings plans. Um, up to 64% uh, of eligible SageMaker machine learning instance types provides flexibility across uh, ML usage types, instance families, sizes, and still regions here. Okay, so multiple different options of savings plans uh, that you can take advantage of. Um, and savings plans launched in 2019 and already customers have saved over $15 billion, right? So take advantage of savings plans if you haven't already. Now let's talk about spot instances. As I mentioned, it's the same capacity as on-demand, right? Same performance, same security, same everything you're used to for a normal on-demand instance type. The key difference is it's our spare capacity, which means it can be reclaimed with a two minute notice, right? We talked about how you could be instance flexible so that when we need server A back, you can quickly replace it with server B, a slightly different flavor. Uh, that does mean it's, it's really good for things like fault tolerant, instance flexible workloads, which tend to be you know, loosely coupled stateless, things like uh, big data, machine learning, uh, high performance computing, media processing, and in particular, we're seeing a lot of customers get significant value from spot instances for their containerized applications today as well, which do a lot of these things by default. Now, I wanna finish this by saying, don't think of spot instances as some small amount of opportunity because since 2015, customers using spot instances have saved over $8 billion, right? So there is a significant amount of money that customers are saving using spot instances while delivering the availability and performance that their workloads really need. All right, <clears throat> so we've selected the best instance uh, size, we've selected the purchase options, um, we're hopefully using a balance of savings plans on demand and spot. You're having a balanced meal there. You're leveraging all three. Now it's time to explore leveraging Graviton. 
which provides the best price performance for a broad set of applications on AWS today. So what is Graviton? Well, I imagine most of you have heard of Intel and, and AMD processors. They power a lot of the fantastic EC2 instance types we offer. But AWS now actually makes our own silicon and offers it as Graviton instance types. Um, and I'll also mention here, we, we do also offer processors from um, Apple, Apple uh, to run uh, Mac OS in the cloud uh, as well. So what's so great about Graviton? Well, as I mentioned, Graviton is actually built by AWS. Um, it's built using the ARM 64-bit processor cores, which actually means it's, it's a similar architecture to that processor in your phone, which means it's incredibly sustainable, low power, uh, low power consumption. But the really awesome thing is because it's built by us, we can build it to target optimizations for cloud native workloads. We can look at the performance characteristics of workloads that customers are running and we can say, hey, if we did this, this and that, we can actually deliver more performance at a lower price. And we can continue to rapidly innovate. We now have Graviton 3 and I'll spend a little bit more time talking about this, but we're innovating rapidly, continuing to improve this platform. So while there's a significant opportunity to optimize moving to Graviton today, you'll actually see when we talk about some of these customer stories that you should expect to continue to reap performance and cost benefits from the Graviton platform for years to come, right? So well, what do you expect if you move today? Up to 40% better price performance by leveraging Graviton today. They are our high, highest performance instances in their families. And the way to think about this is per vCPU pricing is about 20% lower than the comparative x86 instance type. Uh, I'll also mention here that uh, the Graviton vCPU is actually a full core, which is part of, uh, part of many elements that overall deliver an up to 40% better price performance, right? So not only is the per vCPU price lower, you'll actually get better performance for many applications out of Graviton which is seeing customers saving up to 40% uh, overall versus comparable x86 instance types. All right, so um, if you haven't already, start looking at Graviton, particularly for these workloads when you get started. This is by no means an exhaustive list of all of the uh, workloads that we see Graviton being successfully run on today, um, but it's where we see customers able to move fastest and reap benefits quickest, right? So whether it's web, gaming servers, open source databases, through to their analytics and, and microservice workloads. Uh, this is where we would recommend from a compute perspective to get started. But I actually have an even better option. If you're using any AWS service, there's a very good chance that we now have a Graviton support in that AWS managed service. Here is a, here is a picture of a lot of the AWS managed services that support Graviton today. One of the reasons customers like adopting Graviton via these managed services first is it's a click of the button, right? We've already done the work to, to make the application, the service, the managed service that we offer run successfully and very performant on our managed services, which means, as I say, very often it's a matter of clicking one button and you start reaping all of the benefits we've been talking about, whether it's DocumentDB, SageMaker, RDS, Fargate, uh, you know, click one button with an Amazon managed service uh, and, and start leveraging Graviton today. Uh, and that will hopefully also help prove to any naysayers uh, that might think Graviton doesn't work. You'll be able to show them very quickly the price performance impact that making this change has uh, for your services that are leveraging Amazon managed services. Now, I won't go through all of these. You can, you can have a read, but I really do like the uh, modern electron story. They're a, a company focused on decarbonization. And what I really like about this quote is it, it emphasizes what we're talking about. In 2022, they started leveraging Graviton 2 based instance types and they saw a 50% cost improvement over the, uh, the C5 instance type, the x86 variant version of that. Then more recently, they started testing the C7G, right? So the next generation, Graviton 3 based instance. And again, they saw another improvement of 50%. Right? And we're not done innovating here. We're not done improving the overall performance of Graviton. Uh, and so this is why customers are investing so heavily is we really are at day one here. While you can save a significant amount and improve performance, uh, we do expect to continue to see those benefits improve uh, as we innovate on your behalf. Okay, 
We spent a lot of time talking about how to optimize compute because that is oftentimes the number one way for you to, to significantly reduce your cost and improve performance rapidly. Um, but if not equal, at least number two is optimizing your workload price performance with AWS storage services too. Uh, we have a huge portfolio today uh, of storage services um, that can sort of be cl classified into three big sort of categories, I guess, three buckets, no pun intended. Object, block, and file. Um, I want to spend most of time here today focused on object and block because I imagine any of you who are using AWS today are leveraging one of those two services. Um, and if you are using any of our file services, uh, there is a better deep dive that you can spend, uh, that you can go deeper on. So let's just focus on object and block here quickly. All right, so most people think about the object storage services as Amazon S3. Um, and more or less, that, that's a decent way to think about it. But keep in mind that the S3 team has been innovating really rapidly um, over the last, I guess, almost two decades now, 15 years. They've been innovating, adding features and functionality. Very often, again, as we're observing how customers use S3 and we find, hey, there's this access pattern, we could deliver a more highly performant version or potentially optimize and, and lower the cost for that access pattern. So S3 is, is now a, a large number of services uh, that can help you optimize your object-based storage costs. Uh, and again, I don't want you to be too intimidated here, right? There are a whole bunch of different options. Uh, and while some people, you know, really deep storage experts learn each and every one of them in detail, the way I recommend getting started, the quickest way to start optimizing today is just to turn on S3 intelligent tiering uh, on the far left here, right? S3 intelligent tiering, as the name suggests, intelligently looks at your process, at, at your access patterns, at what you expect out of the storage that you have in S3, and automatically tiers them across three different uh, storage offerings to optimize cost while ensuring it delivers the performance that you expect from your object store. And since the launch of S3 intelligent tiering, customers have saved over $750 million, right? So if you're using S3 today and you haven't turned on intelligent tiering, you're missing out on your piece of that growing pie. Uh, so flip that switch and start capitalizing on S3 intelligent tiering. Uh, and again, I'll just explain a little bit more detail here. As I say, it, it automatically delivers those savings for you. You don't need to learn all of the tiers. It, it's going to be safe and careful on your behalf and make sure that you get the performance you need, then it optimizes on your behalf. Um, there's no operational overhead, no, no additional lifecycle fees, no, uh, no retrieval fees. Uh, really, I, th I think the only thing is it's, it's a small um, monitoring uh, fee that, that's delivered here uh, and a small automation fee, right? And again, saving customers a significant amount of money. Now let's talk about block storage, right? Uh, Amazon EBS, the Elastic Block Store. It's scalable, it's simple to manage, uh, it's optimized, uh, and it, it works for mission critical app workloads, right? The vast majority of workloads that run on EC2 leverage EBS in, in some way, shape, or form. And there are multiple different flavors of EBS. Uh, uh, just like all of our offerings, right? Customers, uh, we've, we've identified ways that we can help customers further optimize. As example, right, you might need consistent you know, very high I.O. And so we have provisioned IOPS running on SSDs. You might have a workload that actually just needs really high throughput. And so it's better optimized to run on hard drive disks or even a cold storage workload running on an EC2 instance. We have a flavor uh, to help optimize your EBS version, uh, your EBS costs for all of these different varieties. But again, it's easy to just get started with GP3. It is our general purpose SSD and I recommend selecting the minimum amount of storage that you believe you need for your application. You know, it goes from minimum of one gig all the way up to 16 terabytes of storage. Uh, and then, just like before, the AWS Compute Optimizer can actually look at your real world running workload and then optimize and select, or recommend, I should say, for you, which is the EBS volume that best suits your workload, right? So you just get started with GP3 then you listen to the AWS Compute Optimizer, which is going to recommend, hey, we've actually seen that we could potentially lower costs or eliminate this performance bottleneck um, by migrating or by changing the size of the volume, whatever it may be. So again, there's lots of different options 
that you can use to optimize, but we've taken the hard work out of finding the option that best suits your workload, right? And then the, the extra awesome thing, particularly for any old hats listening in here that have been using EBS for a long time, is that EBS, uh, you know, back in the old days, if you wanted to change the size of the type of volume, it required downtime with maintenance. It required actually taking the server offline and changing the volume. That is no longer the case, right? And that is why I always recommend getting started with GP3 with a minimum amount of storage that you think you need because if either the AWS Compute Optimizer or your own insights make you recognize, hey, we actually need to scale this thing up, there is no downtime required. Maintenance for that type of change is now incredibly easy. So keep that in mind when you're getting started. That's why you wanna start with GP3, pick the minimum amount, and then just let the automated, pro automated recommendations come in and know that you won't have to deal with downtime in order to take advantage um, of those optimization recommendations. All right, we've gotten through a lot so far. The last way that I want you to consider optimizing your costs while improving your overall application performance is actually optimizing resource capacity to fit your demand, right? And so just quick callback, we talked about right-sizing the specific instance, right? Using the AWS Compute Optimizer to select the specific instance that has um, the performance you need while well, the minimum cost that, that we can possibly offer for you. But then the next step is actually to say, well, have I got the right number of those resources running, right? Starting to scale. So the next big way to optimize is to start using EC2 auto scaling groups or auto scaling in general, right? Because uh, if you're not using auto scaling and you're not taking advantage of this functionality, you're gonna end up in either the left or the right uh, or, or some different version of the left or the right where you're either under provisioned or over provisioned, right? And if you're under provisioned, on the left-hand side here, where you have too few instance types, this is where your customers potentially start seeing downtime in your application, or they actually just see the application really slow down to a point that they don't want to come back and use it again, right? So you're, you're sacrificing the performance that you need for your business on the left. Whereas on the right, performance is great, right? There's more capacity at any point in time than your customers need, but that means you're wasting money. You're paying for resources that you and your customers do not need. And so we want to really focus on, you know, having the right number of instance types dynamically scaling just ahead of when they're needed, right? We always have to have a little bit of extra capacity, but how do we get that to the, the minimum amount without ever sacrificing performance? And so the final point I'll make here is if you haven't already started looking at the auto scaling group scaling policies, I recommend getting started with predictive scaling today. For me, this is what auto scaling, the vision of auto scaling has always been, which is you run an application and you say, based on my historic trends, you tell us how to scale AWS. And, and that's what predictive auto scaling does on your behalf. The big benefit it is, just like we saw in that previous picture, predictive scaling can, can predict ahead of time when you're gonna need capacity. So it can bring those servers up and make sure they're uh, running uh, and available before the, the spike in demand comes for your application, the predictable spike comes. Okay, so uh, start leveraging scaling policies. If you haven't leveraged any of these before and you're wondering where to get started, start with predictive scaling. Uh, it's gonna take a, a lot of the heavy lifting, a lot of the thinking out of your hands and make those recommendations uh, on your behalf. And that's it. If I can re recommend one thing for those of you who haven't already started your migration to AWS, get started today with the AWS free tier. Uh, provides a, a whole bunch of different services for you to experiment and play with. Um, and, and they're real services, and you can use them for free for up to 12 months. Um, so if you haven't, get started today with the Amazon free tier, AWS free tier. Thank you.